Okay, I'm going to hit the record button right this minute. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention something. I, I was looking through my various comics, turtle comics, trying to find um, the first printing of issue seven, and I could not find one. But in that search, I did find this second printing of issue five. And I don't know if it, why I never noticed this, but the, in the second printing, the artwork doesn't have tones. Mm. Really? Yeah, it, it's weird. I, I, I was looking at looking through it, and like, Some, something's not right here. And I looked a little closer, and none of the artwork has tones. It's like we we printed it from the black and white copies that we made of the inked artwork, and before it had tones on it. What the? Yeah, I never noticed that before. Are those guys still in business? You should get a discount now. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so bizarre, and that you know, it's actually you might have discovered, or somebody might have discovered a new something to chase. In, yeah, in the in the fan mm. collector things, because I I, I remember the and I I did not know that, and actually I've I've got a couple in my archives back here, um, so I'm gonna pull it out and check it out. But the uh, you know when you see things like um, people will bring up the shows like. Pete, you remember when they switched uh, the covers and the and the um, and the graphics for Tales of the Turtles one? The title with, block, yeah. Title block with Turtles, the, the the reprint of issue four. Right. And so we had the interior of four with the you know the title blocks and everything for four on the artwork for Tales <laughs> number right. one, and then it it got kind of switched around. So occasionally those will show up at, uh, at shows and and. and um, you know that and double covers and of course the issue three misprint kind of thing so it's it's good fun but yeah you could be this could be the next big hot thing <laughs> yeah it's on it's on the uh, the key collectors app right. it'll be nick's picks for right. uh for next week or something did you guys have a um like an assistant or a production person or a secretary that would have been sending out the artwork whenever it was time to do a reprint of issue five i think it was a uh, Peter Laird or Kevin Eastman was doing that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of you guys just slipped them the wrong artwork. Yeah, that's no. bizarre. I can't imagine why we would have done that. It is actually bizarre because I'm thinking, you know, we did have help with, I think, uh, obviously Steve Steve had worked at that time. And though maybe I'm trying to think of the timing when we would have, when we have done the reprint of, um, of issue five. It might have been by the time we got back in Northampton. So maybe maybe we did have help, but, um, but it is... Uh, crazy that it was printed without tones um and that's that's pretty rare because you think like there was a time when we were pete remember we were having pete uh we would have steve levine re-letter all that stuff and we were he was re-lettering them on the original ink stuff because um they were being used also for the uh first comics color reprints right. Right. Um, so it just might have been one of those like, oh, here and uh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I uh, that's that's cool that you spotted that. I, I that's interesting. And it says on the cover, the date is November nineteen eighty seven. Yeah, so so we would have. Yeah, we we would have been back in Northampton by then. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Did you guys send the original art to the printer uh, usually? No. 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 Although. although it's interesting that you asked that question because and we're probably going to get into this when we get into issue uh, six and seven kev i don't know if you remember this but when we started doing the full color covers and we would send the original art to the to the printer or to the separator um and i i can't remember whose artwork it was but it came back from the printer or the separator and they had peeled the artwork apart i think it had been done on a sheet a sheet of uh, thick illustration board and they at that time only had a drum scanner and so they had to peel the artwork peel the upper layer of the artwork off so they could wrap it around the drum scanner which i, I found was horrifying it was just so bizarre that they would do that without telling us or asking us, and I, I think after that one incident, we demanded that they shoot a, a transparency um, and and not peel any more coverage. Mm. 
Yeah, that's unbelievable. Well, it was sort of like, and, and again, that was the early evolution of, uh, you know, and it goes obviously many layers deep of, you know, original art being, you know, submitted to and kept by the, the, the parent corporations of a lot of the big publishers. But it was, artwork was was still considered more of a... It's a byproduct art. of the final thing. It was, a, it was considered a mechanical, part of the mechanical process. It wasn't looked at as art, as we love it and appreciate it as art. It was looked at as... Well, here's here's something <laughs> that somebody did that we need to like pizza peel or scan and do the stuff. This is just one step, one mechanical step in the final production of, of the comic, and it's just, it just was never appreciated the way you know. Um, certainly, we 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 loved it, and so Pete's right. It's like when we did things like that, like because a lot of times um, we would do the original art um, as a separate piece and then photocopy it because. And that was really a, a big inspiration for me from Pete was photocopying everything to keep records of so many different aspects of the creation of the process, sometimes for archival, but also sometimes just for if we started painting a cover and it came out really crappy, <laughs> we didn't ruin the original. Right. We were coloring it on a photocopy, but we'd, exactly. mount it, we'd mount it on a board and color it in, you know, Dr. Martin's or, you know, uh, different techniques, um, acrylics and things. And then... But yeah, I was on a heavier board, so yeah, they would they would peel it, and I remember that clearly. They peeled it, and we were just like, oh. <laughs> there there was a uh, I think actually two letters that were scanned and put into the uh, Fantagraphics oral history book. Uh, what was it called? Uh, well, we told, we you, told so. you so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so so one letter is Gary Groth, one letter is Kim Thompson. It's to the printers, and uh, it's the most aggressive like. Please tell your Cro Magnum <laughs> print guys like this. We value this artwork. Do not mark it up. Do not take the sword to it and slice it up. Like we value this and share this work. Blah blah blah. And like reading that, being Pittsburgh boys, blue collar working class fellas, reading that, I was thinking those Kim Deitch pages probably don't exist anymore. Those guys might have at the print house might have wiped their assholes. With uh, the, with that original arc, see, seeing that kind of disrespectful tone from uh, Uncle Gary. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Your shoe prints on that stuff coming <laughs> right. back. It's hard to well, imagine. Gary has a number of layers of widely and deeply deeply concerning issues and has for <laughs> many years. But actually, let's digress to some really fun stuff. And, yes. Uh, Pete, I'd like to point out. Um, Pete, explain the process on this cover you did, which is fantastic, um, because you did something really exceptional in the. Uh, uh, the drawing and the overlay process when you created it. Well, I appreciate that that sentiment, Kevin. Um, I, as I recall, I used some frisket paper on an on an acetate overlay, and I cut frisket for for the figures on, on the cover. And then I <laughs> I used a variety of colored inks, and I think I used some Dr. Martin's dyes. Um, to do that kind of spacey background. Um, but one, one thing I did, which I, I don't think I've ever done, ever done before or since, I sprinkled salt on the artwork um, because I heard somewhere that mm -hmm. when you added salt crystals to a, a liquid um, like ink, bottle inks, it would create interesting effects. And, and it did in fact do that. I was, I was pretty happy with the with the result. That was going to be question but, number one. How do you achieve uh, the, these these aesthetics? Yeah. Like yeah. I said, I don't think I've ever done it again. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You know, it's, it's funny because, you know, back in the days of when you did any airbrushing or did any kind of effects like that, you did have to cut frisket for it. But I thought it was uh, wonderfully creative. It, it, and, I, and, and I feel like I remember, it seemed like I remember there was, you know, the original artwork that you hand colored and water colored underneath and the overlay was kind of on top. Right. Um, and then that's how it was then photographed for uh, production. Yeah. It's really awesome. And a number of these covers, it's been fun going through these first several issues to see what you guys are doing. You know, like it's, um, you're experimenting. It's very inspiring to look at, you know, as somebody who's aspiring to make comics. I mean, I imagine when this came out, nothing else looked like it. Yeah, to see the hand it was it was important because, you know, the, like you look at how to draw comics the Marvel way is like sacred tablets of how things have to be done and things. And to see a hand, brush strokes in this, like I think that there's even maybe a touch of 
colored pencil or something in some of the shading on the Triceraton there. Uh, and it just made it feel like a tangible thing that you could actually do without the mechanical bend day process. Mm. Also, in, in regards to the, that uh, that salt thing, there are these drawing demos that I've seen Bill Sienkiewicz do online for classes <laughs> and stuff. And this guy, like he will spray bleach on the art and just do the most wild stuff and it would look like a big mess but then he always saves it and turns it into an amazing bill sinkevich illustration no wow. it's funny glad you, you glad you mentioned it because it was a really like we touched on a little bit before we got on the conversation of some experimentation and development development kind of stuff where you know everything from the old DC comics that sometimes have run these semi photographic color covers, yeah, or Jack Kirby doing those kind of photo collages for certain DC comics that he was doing, experimenting with this and that. But I remember um, quite fondly and, and, and quite interestingly when when Pete and I made a one and only trip down to Marvel um, to discuss opportunities there. That um, we actually saw some some pages from Electra mm. that. Um, mm. Bill had been working on. I don't know if you remember Pete, but they. I don't. It was, it was like they had pulled him out of this drawer, and it was like some of the stapling, some of the doilies, and and just some of the stuff that he was doing with really dramatically interesting styles and layering on different kinds of um, textures and things that I thought was, um, you know, quite quite mm -hmm. fascinating. On to issue six, which was um, coming off a tremendously um, intriguing. <laughs> what thing? Five. Which, this, uh, we we the turtles were trapped in an airlock and they were running out of air. Um, this is and, where uh, things things started for for me, like with these editorials, man. Because this is the earliest issue that I was able to get my hands on, young. And uh, you guys are with the forthcoming number seven. You're alluding to a four page story that's going to be uh, inked and colored by uh, Richard Corbin. Pretty freaking cool. Donatello micro series ma mentioned. We're going to see ads for Michael Dooney's Gizmo, Prime Slime Tales. There's some some backup stuff in here from that. Uh, there's allusions to the Cerebus uh, uh, collaboration jam for issue number eight. Like you guys, you guys, uh, the operation is expanding now. Mirage Studios is uh, is a publisher of more than just Ninja Turtles titles at this point. 1986 too. Sharon, Connecticut is the PO box address for issue number six and yeah. we made note last uh last issue that uh steve levine was on uh the ones and twos as the letter of the issue and in just that span of time now that he's on six and i do wonder if he was doing lettering like re-lettering on the old stuff because his lettering has caught up it was a little rough before we mentioned that the aims guide was he didn't have that trick where you tape down the Ames guide at the exact sizes because you could see that the sizes were changing. This is Steve <laughs> Levine lettering, a hundred percent. So he's he's got his his ten thousand hours of practice in by uh, by issue six right here. Well, having gone to the same high school as Steve Levine and having the same math teacher, we weren't good at math, so I think measuring <laughs> stuff was <laughs> no. But it's just funny because you look at the. And actually, is it is it near? Because it's in the collected, but you look at the the title block, which says. Uh, Co-created, written, and drawn by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. And then it says, letters by Steve Levine. And actually, the letters by Steve Levine drops down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but no, but yeah, I think it was a lot that. of um, right. eyeballing and, and stuff with that stuff. But that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the beauty and that's the fun of the time period is we were, we were um, um, just having a really good time and, and making up our own rules because we were the bosses and, and sort of... Yeah. If it worked for us and we were happy, then you know, there you go. It's like, like look at those absolutely freaking insane planetary ships that Pete Laird designed. It's like dr drawing those repeatedly was. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you uh, be very would you do a lot of drawing in ink, like when it would come to these little buildings that that we would see, or uh, were you guys type pencilers still? Um, uh, that was probably um. A lot of that was done in, in ink on, over some fairly loose pencils. Yeah. I think we were getting kind of acclimated to 
getting the basic shapes, but you, I remember you specifically, you know, for some of this stuff, um, especially as the, the little, the traveling Triceraton homeworlds that you designed and had done a series of drawings um, um, of the ships, you know, much like the, uh, the, the flying harnesses and things like that. And so we'd sort of use that as a, as a thing. And then we'd, when the layouts were done and we'd get ready, we'd again, pass the pencils back and forth before jumping in to inks. But I think we, um, and I might venture to say we were starting to develop a bit, bit of a shorthand where we could still say we get the the shape and the pace and the and the and the things blocked in for the pages that we needed and everything was penciled and, and, and still quite a lot of detail if I remember I still got the pencils photocopies of the pencils of these um, but there were er were areas that were loose that we knew that we could fill in later without really doing super detailed pencils um, mm -hmm. that you might see from. You know, maybe an in-house artist at one of the bigger companies that was doing work specifically he he or she knew was going to a an anchor and they wanted to have their you know trademark and have up all the information there so um, but yeah that's 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 fun was, when, uh, when you take a look at at the pages from this issue uh where where is mark friedman uh in the big picture of things like uh, is he is he does he have the plushy Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle doll, and he's taking it to all the places yet, or you know, is that stuff happening with, while you're making issue seven? This was 1987. I'm just, I mean, it's finding it interesting that you mentioned that the return address was still sharing Connecticut because I thought we had moved back to Northampton sooner, but uh, maybe wrong. Um, but maybe there was stuff being forwarded. Um, but I know the the first meeting with Mark Friedman was was definitely in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, not long after Peter and I had gotten our first office space on Center Street, um, because we can were... I, can I jump in and just... Oh, oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, one thing. Uh, I'm looking at the indicia of this, this issue, and it says 1986. Yeah. 86. Ah, 86, yep. That might have been the transition year when we moved back. Yeah. Did, did we meet Mark in 86? Because the the playmate thing and the animated series started in eighty seven. That's right? right. That's a that's a really good question because I feel like um, we had definitely obviously we'd moved back to to Northampton. Um, uh, we had um, uh, rented the office on Center Street. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and I remember we would either we were still move in the process of moving in or even painting or doing some repair we're work painting when, the office paint, <laughs> painting the office and mark mark showed up um but it seems it seems like it might have been later 86 but i feel like at the same time um there's no way if it was early 87 that we would have accomplished so many steps including trips to um the west coast and meetings and oh. in, 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 the, in the periods of meetings with some of the animation companies to actually have the TV show, the first five part episode come out on the air, um, which it did in that Christmas holiday break in 1987, leading, you know, leading into New Year 1988. So it must have been 86 that we met Mark, because um, there were so many steps to begin the process of so many things that fell into place rather quickly, but it was um, um, kind of pathetic that you don't remember the date of this very important thing. <laughs> well, we were you know day drinkers at that time. <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, it's it it is funny, but there was sort of um not to belittle any of it, but I think that we were so happy to be drawing comics and you know, crikey, we had a you know, Mirage Studios wasn't a Mirage anymore. We actually had an office, which was crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh we had a little little storeroom for <laughs> shipping back orders, people ordered and a couple of desks in there and uh and all that. So it was just sort of our priorities were where they were for all things comics and figuring out distribution and what the next issue is going to be and so many other elements. Um, it was really wasn't on that, you know, that, that. You know something you, you, when you just said, mentioned the office on center street, I flashed on something I hadn't thought of in a, in a long time. Do you remember the jam that we did on the Godzilla artwork with Steve Bissett? Very much. Eric, Eric and Jim and Steve Levine and maybe Mike Dooney also contributed. That was done in that office. 
Yep. No, I believe so. It was uh, that was really fun because that was uh, um, you know you being a big dinosaur fan and Bissett, of course, um, and then all of us being you know um, Godzilla fans uh, as a whole. It was really neat to 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 put that together because it was including all the all the different related Godzilla yeah. universe characters. It was quite a lot of fun. Yeah. As you recall, I got to draw a Mecha Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see who drew uh, Jet Jaguar. <laughs> Did, was that was that piece? Uh, was it published by Dark Horse? I, you know, I was just going to ask Kevin what we did that for. I, I cannot recall at the moment. I remember that, I, and I've got a copy in my archives. Of, it was it was definitely done as a print. It was used for something, but I do think it was a. I don't think it was ever used as a cover or anything. But I think it was. Uh, Maybe a, a pinup in one of the issues, uh, not art, but you know, maybe in the in the in the, in the issues. But I, okay. I, I feel like I remember seeing that as we we made them into, into some kind of print. Um, Bess Bessette did a bunch of really awesome oddball Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle pinups for Archie of like those like Z-list like toy characters, the floating cow head thing, and like the oh. the, the 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 moose mounty character. Power. Yeah, yeah, like uh, that, that's that's like one of those deep cut cool turtles comics. One of the reasons I asked about uh, the Mark Friedman connection at this level is we were just looking at a page. It had Triceratons, it had Fugitoid, mm -hmm. other characters that are toys very very rapidly, and I was just wondering if that was like starting to be a thought in your minds or whatever. Because like I feel like the comics never really reflected that kind of consumerish kind of thing you guys are just doing your thing but these things did become toys and and they look ready to go for it well i think you know um what was fun is uh because you know again i'm thinking about the timing here um um you know scratching my right uh, old brain is uh because you know we as we reflected on last time was um some of the dark horse miniatures that were being done around the time the little lead figurines um uh where they actually did triceratons and they right. did the, the harnesses and they did so many different characters that had uh, evolved from the series. So the role playing games were still ongoing, but that was sort of definitely overlapped into the Friedman discussion. But I think the triceratons as, as toys and elements in the, say the Archie comics and the entertainment, the toys and uh, the, the cartoon shows came, came a bit later because as the show became successful and popular that there was a, a lot of going back and mining on some of those um, those original ideas that uh, um, and again I, I still reflect on one of the coolest bad guys ever created which was uh, the Triceratons um, thank you Peter it was uh, it was such a great pain in the end you know what I, and I tell you just this is a quick digression is a uh, People will still ask me to do Triceratron sketches at uh, uh, conventions, and I have the hardest time because I can never get the freaking horns right. Um, you know, because it was always like, if you turn the head just a certain way, you can mm. sort of get the horns and then sort of <laughs> the shape of that. But I never got it down to a quick sketch that you could sort of. I hear you. I still have problems with that myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Throughout this issue, and maybe even the next, there are things that will be coming up where I do wonder like do you leave this one to Pete because there's 10 triceratons <laughs> on this page man and, and uh, it's just more efficient that way also the, by the way the, the thought balloon with fugitoid with the square shaped uh, little mm. circles kind of go into the brain excellent mm. touch you get chef's kiss for that uh, the ability to weave in B story where you're in you know, ex extraterrestrial environment. Now, now we're touching back down to Earth, man. Seeing where April is at the si same uh, moment in time. Yes. Really, really smart. Really good storytelling too, and something that, quite honestly, I see a lot of cartoonists today that don't seem capable of having a couple of threads going simultaneously. Right. Or at least they choose not to. Maybe if they are capable, um, it's pretty impressive stuff to be doing as like an early work, and you know, no editor or anything to kind of push you in that direction. It seems like you guys have the mechanics of comics down very well. Well, thank you. well if, if you liked it, then I did it. When you did... It's funny, I would say, you know, it's, it's really cool, Pete. Um, I was just looking at... I didn't realize we did those... Um, I had forgotten we did those word balloons, and I don't think we used them beyond, but it's really cool that the, for some reason when we were doing the... Um, 
or in, in, and Steve was doing the lettering at that time, that the uh, word balloons were actually these square shapes of these kind of square thought balloons. Because that was a big thing back in comics back in the day was that um, a lot of exposition by mainstream writers who were often paid by the word, I think, <laughs> uh, would add lots of thought balloons and things of, to describe what was going on in the panel and what they were thinking. Um, but no, that's that's kind of cool. That's uh, I had forgotten about that. Um, so yeah, that was definitely my idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's very but, expressive. Even as we go to like television commentators, they get a different treatment for their word balloon borders as well, and um, it just makes the visuals more exciting. You know, it's it's a little more variety, and it makes clear who's speaking. When you draw the television screens, would 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 you call that Dark Knight television screens or? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it, I think other people had done it yeah. before, but I think Frank Miller um, definitely uh, used it to great effect um, for for a, a storytelling device, and uh, and that was one of the things that um, I think when you you touched on because it was really we were getting very detailed in our storylines. We you know the Fugitoid was was brought in officially. We were really exploring the uh, the the bigger picture of the secret of the ooze, if you will, um, uh, bringing in the utrams and the race and the Triceraton, Triceraton backstory and, and connecting a lot of really exciting dots for us. Um, um, and, and that was part of the the pacing of sort of the turtles have been gone now for a period of time uh, from issue four, where they were sent on the transmat into outer space. And so April's, you know, going back to New York, because we want to sort of reflect us what's going on there as the Utrams have become more of a thing after the big blast and uh, we want to revisit April um, and, and what's going on. Telling these stories, we did them with, with what felt really good to us and what worked for us. And that's, I've got no other... <laughs> I might yeah. feel real embarrassed if it's super obvious, but the name Chester and Chet comes up a <laughs> lot and uh, I wonder like if that's inside deal. I see you both smiling and laughing. Uh, just curious what 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 Chet is about. I see it in the background here. Chet's toys we, shows up. I, I'm not sure, sure why, but for some reason the name Chet just made us laugh. And uh, we stuck it in every, every place we could. We were complete goofballs. That's, <laughs> the, there's no other reason. And that was, and I think it was by the time we did some revisitation to the origin story that we actually made the poor child holding the terrarium when the when the canister of ooze hit it, we named him Chet. Yeah. For whatever reason, Chet made us laugh, and that was. <laughs> so now we're now we're going Howard Cosell, Wide World of Sports, Muhammad Ali versus uh, Superman, with uh, some color before, commentators. Before we do that, can I just point out one small Please. Uh, detail on the previous page, um, page fourteen? Yes. Um, is in the one of the uh, word balloons for the TV reporter, he mentions a Jim McNaughton, and I believe that's a call out to an old friend of Kevin's. Yep, that is. I think we yeah because we may name the reporter uh, uh, Jim McNaughton because I think he shows up in in very early on page seven. But it was it was a call out. Thanks for mentioning it. It was uh, when I was in. Uh, high school and uh um and i'm sure Pete can relate to this we were called geeks and not in the nice way that um, they are now referred to so i used to sit with uh you know it was kevin eastman jim mcnorton and david peabody um you know david peabody was um abnormally tall uh, jim mcnorton was even taller for seventh grade eighth grade um but we all love comics and so we'd sit in the lunchroom reading comics um, and uh, talking about, you know, becoming, you know, following in the footsteps of, you know, Jack Kirby's and so many other people that we we, we <laughs> inspired. So I, I did a number of uh, early concepts and creations with, with Jim McNaughton, who, um, you know, was the writer and I was the artist guy. So <laughs> would, 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 would we see those uh, collaborations in something like gobbledygook? No, no, it's before that no. time. It was before that. Yeah, it was before that time. Cause yeah, yeah. By the time we get to gobbledygook it was a lot of Pete and I were doing a lot more um, short stories and other stuff together and, and other artists doing short stories. And 
But yeah, that's. But thanks for bringing it up, Pete. That's, I forgot when Jim was. Jim was a character, but yeah, he was. Uh, he was one of my buds from early on. Still lives in Maine. So. Here's a cool nerdy thing that uh, we can show off because we have the issue in in the collection. Is uh, you see the sound effect is not kind of colored in here, but it is in the printed original issue. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. It's it's like there's a couple different versions of these Xeroxes going going around, man. Yeah. Uh, that's how these these printers are getting them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> these crowd scenes, man. These crowd scenes. Uh, th is it a thing where the penciler who creates the composition does the other guy go? You know what? You could ink that one too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 funny. I think there was still a quite a bit of swapping around yeah um, but i can see just below that panel like uh, the one you just pointed out with the giant the the large tooth dinosaur which those look like peter laird teeth with maybe my guy with a number 12 shirt on or something but then if you look at the panel right below that to me looks like something peter inked entirely by himself but there was still a number of of swapping around um uh, for these pages, especially when you get to some of the crowd scenes and, and things, because there were, um, we never shied away from doing big scenes and making the big scenes. Um, and I think that really harkens back to some early um, Kirby influences, which I always bring up, because it was always, he was a great master of establishing these big set pieces, which really brought you into the story. So I feel like. Right. You know, we always try to capitalize on if we could show you that they're in this massive place and there are thousands of people in there it sort of it brings you into the story we're, we're trying to tell and uh, but i think there was definitely still lots of swapping swapping back and forth so um, epic uh, uh, that page 15 that we're looking at yeah uh, we're, we're just looking at i want to point out something here that uh, i noticed when i was reviewing this a couple of days ago there's that on page 15 there's that um in the center of the, the top panel the three-sided arena uh, for where they're going to have the battles yeah if you go back to page three that two-page spread we actually had the foresight to include that asteroid ship in the upper right hand corner oh yeah there it is that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 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 good stuff, man. Wow, that's awesome. That was definitely my idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an amazing uh, sort of no, that was fun. Uh, thing that you built where you get to just draw a bunch of cool monsters. <laughs> uh, you you don't have to be precious because you're seeing them once, so you you could go all out with that. Uh, this image right here. It makes me think of like the Cockrum yeah. X Men cover where there's the the battle. Uh, is that is that an influence for this piece? It was actually a lot of uh, that was kind of a standard device um, used a lot of times when you would have uh, say a large team up or yeah. crossover say between uh, X Men and Teen Titans or um, two. You know, you, you see sometimes George Perez and a lot of people do these sort of descending sort of lineups of all these combatants coming in and i think it was definitely uh inspired a lot of people had done it before and a lot of people that yeah. used it to great effect and 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 it was just um you know i it's just one of those things i was watching just flicking through channels the other night and they had um uh, braveheart was on and there's a great it's pretty typical that you know they would do that to show the epicness of a battle they would show you this v-shaped perspective you would see start seeing the armies, the the combatants on the furthest point away start clashing, and it would slowly come back until the last two were right in your frame um, when they met, and it just really gave you the the, the epicness epicness of it. So I think you know creatures of pop culture and media and and those kind of things we definitely um, uh, were inspired by and leaned heavily on some of those those great ideas. So. One of the beauties of the of the page count is that we're going to be able to get that schmoz, man. We're going to be able to get that fight and, and have that extended over some period of time. But uh, 
making note of the Triceraton weapon, this brought me back because that was that was an accessory with the toy. <laughs> it really yeah. was, man. And also, it's a super cool design. That like double, like it pulls apart. Mm -hmm. That's hard, dude. Yeah, for real. Um, it's it's cool too to see them say like on that previous page, "Let's go kick some ass." And it seems maybe quaint now, but that really meant something. In a day of like reading mostly Marvel and DC, it was cool to see that. Like this had that little bit extra violence of of edge. Yeah, well, we'll see some cool impalement, but like this, it's this kind of stuff that like the kids in class who had bigger brothers who knew the Mirage comics, because it was a game of telephone, they were like. The turtles say the F word. They <laughs> chop off people's heads, but only in the black and white one. Like, you got to get those, man. Like, you see April naked, and it's like, what? Really? Like, 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 like <laughs> and none of I don't those think things. Code April naked, or, you no. Know, I don't think we used the F word unless it was Fugitoid. But yeah, it was, uh, none of that ever existed, but that was like, that was the, the playground. That's funny. Gossip. Like, you got to get the black and white turtles. There's so much blood. And there's not even there's not even like you know that much blood. It's totally. It's great to see a page like this. Like once we get into the fighting, and it totally goes not Marvel in that like we're not going to have them doing two minutes of back and forth in each panel. Right. Like, this is a heated, fast, lots of action happening, and it it again it feels like you guys are breaking rules that like I didn't have any Marvel DC books that had this kind of like let's just get into an intense fight that looks scary. And also like if this is a Marvel book. We'd be uh, there would be pathos on every panel, and you'd be you thought balloons and quips. Yes, and it's like no, nah, it's balls to the walls. Uh, we saw a triceraton from the back. How tough are back muscles to freaking draw that <laughs> shit? Man, it's so yeah, aggravating. I would, I would like to point out uh, and give Kevin his due credit. This kind of fight scene that goes on for multiple pages that was all his doing. Awesome layouts. Thank you. Well choreographed. Still looks awesome. You know, decades later, it's still an awesome fight scene. Yeah. You know, I think it was, you know, again, to, to really harken back to the, the concept of, um, you know, you had, you know, Peter and I were in full control. So, so you know, when we look at uh, Bruce Lee movies, one of the coolest part of Bruce Lee movies was the fight scenes. And mm -hmm. you want to see the whole fight scene. And then when we were fans of, say, um, master kung fu uh some of the early comics master kung fu especially the galacy issues and even some of the gene day stuff it was um there was some really good fight scenes but they were like you described pretty perfectly it was they were very short and it was a lot of the times uh, filled with exposition and thought balloons and and things and so when we could approach a scene like this and we had characters using weapons and in, in martial art and we wanted to do the intensity we could we had the ability to do a fight scene um, and extend it and, and make it work um, for us as an exciting storytelling device. Um, it was an exposition. We had gotten you through, here we are, and here's the place, and here's the space, and here's the setup, and why would you shy away from from really um, landing that knockout blow, you know, um, so to speak, with doing a fight scene that really was fun to draw <clears throat> and um, had some intensity because um, that's that's what made those those scenes work, um, you know, uh, um, and, and and the movies and things and um, so yeah that's that's fun but thank you it was it was these were great to do and and that was uh, some of the stuff that we talked about early on even with um, in some of the fight scenes is you know perhaps we don't need all those sound effects in every scene although we had sound effects but you didn't have to go crazy we didn't have to have them talking and bantering and you know little you know quips and things of like well here take that you little nugget and you know i mean just it was just sort of stuff you wanted to keep it straightforward as a as a as a, as a storytelling device and so it it feels like a bruce lee fight scene where like those things just happen rapidly like we're just watching movement you know cause effect cause effect moment 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 boom when we get to the inevitable you know sword impaling and this ain't your marvel comic this ain't the clothing tent that frank miller had to do with electra we could show some stuff mm -hmm. you guys are the bosses no that was very very you know very lucky and this was this was all growth and learning and you know um you know we were now approaching 
you know, a couple hundred pages of yeah. storytelling that Pete and I had done together. Um, so it was really a steady evolution of. Um, yeah. I, I agree 100% with what Kevin just said. And uh, just looking at that panel you were pointing out a, a couple of minutes ago, where the um, treasure of time is lunging forward. Yeah. And Leo is stabbing him with his sword. It's pretty brutal when you really look at it closely because he's not actually stabbing him. He's chopping his shoulder. Oh. <laughs> That's outlaw comics, baby. <laughs> it's 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 great stuff, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. The Masters of Kung Fu as you know, yeah. like um context is a really nice insight as well because that's one of those books that has also persevered yeah um you know long after it 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 ran its course like i feel like people still revere that book and it's cool to think about this fight scene kind of in that lineage of you know the great comic fight scenes sure sure and and like we just saw the two stabbing weapons get their shine and i think you guys do a great job in selling the wooden stick as being an effective tool because like certainly as little kids it would always be like, well, I want the big freaking sword. Like, I'm afraid of the stick. And uh, for those at home, uh, if you play that first Nintendo uh, video game, you get Donatello down to about half power, and he's the strongest Ninja Turtle. He could beat everybody with one hit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great seeing these weapons break down. Yeah. You know, that feels like some real stakes. Like, hey, this is dangerous. Because we saw the Psy break earlier in the fight scene, too. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's some good stuff. <laughs> and, and and more choreography here, man. Like commandeering, like the 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 sort of the the camera ship. And, well, that was yeah. You know, it's funny because you, and that's the the fun about the creation of the story, if you will, is that you know, uh, and we've seen it. Both Peter and I have seen it done to um, lesser successful effect, if you will. Um, if you put your character into a situation, you have to also get them out of that situation to right. continue the story. Yeah. So it was sort of, uh, you know, there was, so there was some thought of like, okay, we're getting him in. How do we, get, how do we get him in out of the scene? And, uh, um, and so, sometimes as you know, we, we definitely from time to time would lead on the, the science and the magic of comics, if you will. But there was also, um with, with with definitely careful thought discussion we discussed a lot of the stuff and uh um to make sure that um it, it, it worked um <laughs> for for uh you know if it, if it was logical to us if we believed it then it, it certainly helped um you know nudge nudge wink wink kind of thing so it, like it had to work we're, we're coming up to page 30 here and uh, i'm thinking about a conversation that we had on the channel with eric larson a couple of weeks ago where he had actually maybe some regret uh, when it came to Savage Dragon about not adhering to like the 22 page format that comics typically would have at that time. And uh, so that he could put it out on like a kind of more regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you guys ever have those thoughts about this? Because it could have been certainly Turtles was running high. You guys were doing super well. And I remember like. There's always the formula that you guys talk about. If we do this, you know, every X amount of months, if we sell this many, we could live. But if you cut these issues in half, they are the size of a comic and could have come out more frequently. So do you have any yeah. thoughts about that? I don't know if we ever really seriously discussed it uh, at length or whatever. Uh, it just always felt this is a good length for the comics that we wanted to create. You know, it, it allowed us a lot of breathing room for storytelling. Yeah. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. I yeah. think it was we kind of set this this pattern in motion, and it was we were happy with it. I think sometimes, you know, slugging it out in the trenches the way we needed to 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 draw them, <laughs> draw all the pages and and fit everything in. But that was you know that was the that was the dream. That's what we wanted. So it wasn't this sort of like you know it wasn't one of those be afraid of what you wish for. It's like that's what we really wanted to. to this is what we wanted to do. So. And it just seemed like, given the stories we wanted to tell, that 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 length of comics, that thirty-eight to forty pages, was what we worked best with. Yeah, yeah, Agreed. just just fantastic as reading experience, man. Re really appreciated it as as readers for sure. The prime leader gets uh, 
gets uh, held hostage, man, held captive. Uh, he's, a, he's a bargaining chip for the TMNT to get their butts back home. Also trading some of the uh, ninja weapons for some, some guns. Yeah, dude. We're going sci-fi with with it, man. Uh, but our prime leader, he ain't going to be long for this world as they <laughs> as they turn a corner. And uh, those minions, those Triceraton minions, they're taking the shock and awe approach. That's true. And they, they, uh, they light up their dude. He's done. Gone. <laughs> These are some yeah, badass poses, like man. You know, for um, a lot of the inspiration was, um, uh, for sure, obviously, we touched on it last time a little bit, too, was just our, our mutual respect and, and, and passion and appreciation of Star Wars. Um, and so I think doing a lot of the stuff, we really wanted to to do that. And uh, um, I've still got a photograph here somewhere. Of, you know, Pete Laird actually made a Stormtrooper outfit when he <laughs> was at Mass, which is... Uh, which is quite awesome and impressive, but uh, I th I think some of bringing mixing both our loves for the, sort of the martial arts aspect and all things um, George Lucas and Star Wars and what we loved about that Star Trek and so on. It was great to to be able to do that. We could yeah, have there's this. definitely a lot of Star Wars influence. Sure. In we could we could end uh, the the story part with a tone that we kind of talked about earlier with the uh, the reprint of uh, issue number five. You drop the tones off of your guys here, and it creates that illumination, some mm. luminosity that something is is happening right there, as uh, we we get our turtles out of uh, Triceraton land. Right. There's there's also uh, I can see that we we tried to enhance that effect by inking those figures very lightly. Yeah. Would this big Faz be Steve Levine, or did you guys draw that in there? Hmm, good question. It was definitely, um, my opinion is it was definitely in the layout, um, but it was because uh, we really wanted to separate the two worlds, and I would say for sure that the incredibly detailed effect you see of them disappearing was definitely drawn by Peter. I can definitely, I feel like I can 100% confirm that, that whole transparency of them being transported out of that scene, mm -hmm. um, but it was to showcase we were getting um um say at least comfortable but maybe even a bit creative with the use of um the duo shade and so that you could we'd look at a scene like this and go well the scene in the center will be without tones and it'll have this specific effect um and then beyond that we'll do it like we normally did and then add the tones and so it really would help you create a, a 3d effect as we were Again, quite comfortable um, in this um, in this black and white universe that the the turtles existed in. It was uh, uh, just I don't know. I felt like home. Felt like a good. It was a good place, a good space. So check this out with the conclusion. Uh, we're we're promoting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number seven with an on sale date of March thirtieth, eighty six. So when we saw that indicia, like if anything, we're at like January. 86 when, when this thing comes out maybe, maybe even 85 december something like that man but you guys you got the mundans bar backup yeah. story uh in grim jack 26 i think there's a collection of a bunch of those man i'm not sure if the turtles are strip is in that one man i but have that's worth checking i have out. that grim jack turtles. yeah me too uh we we got the richard corbin thing being called out as being uh, a full a full color deal was he hard to find like he's uh notoriously reclusive uh do you do you, kevin do you remember how you uh, connected with uh corbin because he also states that you guys were an influence on the second part of his self-publishing career um you know in, in short um i was a uh, introduced to richard corbin initially through heavy metal magazine sure. uh, some of the early issues uh um, with uh, his Den project, much like um, another underground artist, and some of those early issues was you know Von Bodie and and some others sort of mixed in with uh, the introduction of you know guys like Mobius and Belial and, and other the Sweet and Bron you know things that came in through heavy metal, and uh, it was um, kind of um, in and around the same time I I, I had. Uh, um, had uh, before meeting Pete and around meeting Pete, and during that time, I'd actually had 
was lucky enough to make a couple trips into Boston because we didn't have many comic book stores um, where I lived in Maine and um, found some underground comics and uh, um, I bought, you know, some early Richard Corbin um, underground self-published comics. And on a whim, I, I um, and actually as a funny aside through Pete's good friend, Norman Witte, years later, I bought tons and tons of more Richard Corbin comics, which uh, I still have over there. And actually that's, the cover for Richard Corbin's um, painting he did for Peter and I for uh, the reprint of issue two on the wall of treasure. Um, but I had found some of his Fantagore self-published books and I wrote him a letter and just said, Hey, I'm a big fan. And, and so we, and he was very um, reclusive and, but he, he and his wife, Donna, I got to know uh, a bit over the years. And, and a lot of times she would write letters back for, for, for Richard, much like, uh, Roz Kirby would do for Jack. Um, some of the wonderful letters we got from the Kirby's were, you know, penned by Roz, um, uh, kind of thing. Um, but, um, um, yeah, so we just started trading notes and, you know, um, when he unfortunately answered my letters, then I got more brazen and eventually asked him <laughs> to work on some stuff and uh, he agreed. And, uh, but uh, yeah, cool. it was, a, you know, it's always a, curious thing where they have that old adage where you know sometimes you should be afraid to meet your heroes because sometimes it's disappointing um corbin wasn't he was very shy and reclusive and i totally get it because i was that kind of kid um but then you know you compare it also to you know pete and i meeting jack kirby who was just the every bit of the legend that he was always um he just was the legend he just loved his fans and he was so very kind to us and, and very nice and, and just was you know, it was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Check out this spread right here. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter, go ahead. Oh, I was just, uh, make the comment that, uh, and I think Kevin will agree with this, is that that Cor that, um, collaboration he had with Corbin was kind of a dream come true for him. Yep. It was. Yep. Yeah. So cool that you can make that happen. We're looking at a spread here advertising gizmo number two, uh, the Dark Horse miniatures and not affiliated with Dark Horse comics. That was something that I was always curious about as a kid. Like, is was that how Dark Horse got their seed money right. to like become a publisher? Uh, the little pewter figures or whatever. And you see, man, there's a Triceraton, there's a Fugitoid Casey Jones uh, yeah. built into there. So, so Mirage is growing. We're, we're pointing toward uh, issue number eight with mm -hmm. the TMNT meets Cerebus, the Aardvark right. issue. That, that is forthcoming. That'll be uh, exciting to talk about. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I'd like to point out, just as a funny aside, is uh, I love the miniatures ad. Um, it always cracks me up um, because not only, because we had these miniatures and we were buying some and selling them, obviously, through the thing in Dark Horse was releasing them through hobby stores. But, you know, Pete hand drew all those, <laughs> all those little, because we, there was no way to sort of photograph right. the miniatures to actually show them what they look like. And so Pete took it on himself to literally hand draw, take the lead figures and then hand draw them so we could use them in the different sets for sale. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It's like, the, you know, the few times that you would get to see, you know, Joe Kubert draw Batman or something would be for some Mego figures or something. It's like carrying that tradition. This is a cool piece, man. The, the Jack Kirby petition, petition that you guys got put in the back there, man. Uh, big talk at the time. Give Kirby back his artwork. It seemed like a no-brainer to us yeah. that he, they should do that. And, of course, please uh, return it to a Comics Journal so, like, Uncle Gary just likes to needle Marvel Comics. <laughs> you know? like no, no matter the cause, just... Well, it's like, you know, it's funny. I've, I've, I've actually, um, you know, have... I've gotten to know Gary and I've done interviews with him and talked to him numerous times over the time. And I, and, and when I have the chance, because we've gotten to be, you know, quote unquote friendly, um, I've been able to needle him. Um, and the, is, is absolute hands down bona fide 100% denial of the success of the turtles. He never wanted to refer to it as successful. He never wanted to refer to it as a thing, an icon, a creator owned property in, in the champion of, getting jack kirby's artwork back which we were all in tune with and and you know and, and kirby himself had even said in discussions with him that he said look kids you know, you know kid i know you know it was the nature of the business at the time we didn't like it but we had put a roof over our head and we fed our families and that was the nature of the business we had 
our little studios and our sub studios and the Eisner Iger and Simon Schuster and, and all these guys that were providing content for a wide variety of outlets. Um, um, and uh, he just said, we knew what it was. We didn't like it and it was unfair. And when it came to the recognition that we were all starting to enjoy because of what these pioneers had created for us, we, you know, Pete and I, of course, were very, 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 very adamant that it's just not fair. And, and, and you need to give this, legend his artwork back you need to give him the credit that he's due we're here because of what he's done and what he's given us for imagination and inspiration and so yeah we were very very adamant but it was uh and so gary was one of the people that did help lead the charge and you had a lot of people like frank miller and and so many others that you know felt the same way working within you know actually li like literally speaking out about their bosses saying guys come on you know comics aren't for 12 year olds and under anymore they're for adults and this and you know also creators rights and creator ownership and you know for the, you know for the love of god respect this guy that this built this helped built this universe and these people that helped build this universe and so yeah it was very we were all very passionate and very lucky um to help in any way we could during that time period and for the and for the people who at home who, who might not exactly know the score marvel quote unquote had they kept the artwork but it would show up at conventions and people were selling it jimmy and i get got hold of these uh super graphics starenko catalogs that were selling original art and uh they're selling kirby stuff in there for like 30 bucks 40 bucks stuff that did not pass through you know unethically sourced jack kirby artwork that uh has cr created a market for itself that he had no participation in mm. so there was definitely shenanigans being done i think it was stolen and i think you know i might be wrong but I, you know i i thought Pete, you had actually bought a couple pages early in the day and actually mailed them back to the kirby's um because you felt um it was, it was. I didn't it was, actually mail, mail them back. I offered to, and they said, "No, you keep them." That's right. Yeah, but I remember that that was, it was one of those things that you bought them because, you loved them. Yeah. But also, yeah. it's like when you knew that they were stolen, you definitely said, "You know, I would like to return these to you." And and you know, it's classic. There, every now and then, too, you you go to a dinner or something, and uh, the guy might have an original art collection, and there will be like you could tell there's a frame here. You can tell there's a frame over here. There's a blank space right there. Mm -hmm. And these guys, it's it's often a Kirby or a Ditko or something that they have that they take down while guests are at the house because it's, you know, it's what do you call it? It's, it's stealing to me, but you can't go to jail for it. Right. Starting to publish uh, other titles yes. now. What? What? How? How does that come about? What's that like? Especially this fella, uh, t Tony uh, Bascalito. Uh, how are you said? Yes, uh, I only know him from from this work. Mm -hmm. So where does he come from? Uh, I think we met him when we were living in Connecticut, and uh, I can't remember exactly how that came came about. Did we meet him at a convention, Kevin? Do you remember? It. I, I I feel like um, that I, I would assume that we we probably met him at a show or maybe a small signing and things. We were doing lots of um, little drive to uh, um, promotional events um, and we might have met him at something there. And I think that we ended up inviting him to up to visit us in Sharon um, uh, um, at that time early on to uh, where I believe that's I'm pretty sure that's where he presented us with the. He had a number of puppets and i think we might have bought one or two but also he presented us with um with the turtle mm -hmm. oh that's fine wait was it was that the turtle that friedman used yes oh that is extra cool man wow. so check out the turtle power documentary this is the sort of prototype that that friedman talks about driving to playmates toys in different places showing it off as like look look at what this thing can be also noteworthy of this this dude's art is that he's also using duotone, but he's using that Howard Chaikin American flag duotone board that has the, the pebbly texture. Mm. Yep. I want to point out one thing really quickly. Um, yeah. Mark Fried would never return that. We need Mark. to start the petition. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think um, the choice of the uh, 
the American flag dual shade was also uh, we we were we loved the extra gray tones and the different um, um, levels of of tonality in the in the book. So when we we decided to do prime slime tales um, through some of his work and eventually teamed him up with Jim Lawson, I think it inked some of his stuff. Um, we we thought it'd be great to utilize um, um, the duo shade, but a different pattern just to give it a bit more depth. It's, it's, it's duo shade is part of the Mirage studios yeah. brand. Uh, you know, when, when these other fellas start drawing turtles comics and it has the duo shade stuff on it, I uh, look at any other companies, you know, Caliber Press, like they're not using duo shade like that. There might be a guy, yeah, you know, Tim Bradstreet might artist, pop up or something. Artist, right. Yeah, but like uh, the duo shade is, is part of uh, the legacy, man. And Peppers. Peppers and who is that? Peppers and Sater? Sather? Sater, I think. Do the, do the pinup? Is this more just uh, convention people that you meet? Or maybe, maybe through the mail. I mm. can't recall exactly. But I think we... We've... Yeah, that was that was a nice pinup. It was a nice pinup. We were getting. I think you're right, Pete. I think we were getting lots of uh, wonderful. You know, we had you know um, the post office box, and we were getting lots of nice letters that we were using in the letters pages, um, and and people would send pinups, and we might have even asked potentially for pinups um, in one of the letters pages, maybe, and said, "Hey, if you got a turtle pinup, send it, and and we'll, we'll we'll use it for the back inside back cover," which was a fun way to promote other uh, actually on the inside front cover of this book uh this is an issue of pinup page features the work of jeff gaither and willie peppers nice. willie peppers is a great name sounds like a baseball oh, player yeah. uh you guys like there would be pinups men i'm blanking on the one dude's name mark mark panacea mark panacea or how, I, I don't know how you pronounce it but he becomes you know it's got an early tmnt pinup and then like he was the broad X editor when I was doing X Men Grand Design, and that you know that might be his first published work or something. Super cool seeing that stuff. Yeah. Want to th want to thank you guys for uh, joining us for this uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle number six uh, conversation. I know that it's uh, con season, so Kevin, let the people know what the what the schedule is so that they can come meet you. Oh sure, yep, um, yeah, we're we're um, you know you can always go to kevinismanstudios dot com and we list the the, the events. Um, this weekend we're going to be at, in South Carolina, and then two weeks into um, um, uh, amazing Arizona, amazing Las Vegas show. So um, yeah, we're um, you know as we're heading towards, um, we put a few more shows in than normally we do um, this year, but we're also heading towards twenty twenty four, which is um, a big big anniversary for us. Um, 20, 40 years, Pete. Holy cow! I know. <laughs> So, That's beautiful. Uh, hard to believe. Yeah. Peter, I went to go see the uh, the Super Mario movie, and they had a, a trailer for uh, the TMNT flick that Seth Rogen or whatever is putting together, and there's this one part where their characters are moving across, and I think there's, like, maybe it's a hotel. There's a neon sign that says The Laird nice. or something. That was that was pretty pretty fun to see. I saw that. Do you yeah, have, yeah, Kev, go ahead. Oh no no! I say I I, I uh, saw that too. I thought that was awesome, but I I I've, um, I've heard through through people that um, Mr. Rogan is a is a big fan of of, of all things turtles, and and I th I thought it was funny. I thought it was a really clever. Um, I like the whole, you know, thing about the ooze it kind of yeah, rolls off. Your tongue. I, don't, I don't know. I just it, it it seemed you know because I really enjoyed the animation take on the. Um, Welcome to the Spider Verse and some of the other things. So I, I don't know. It just seems super fun and clever, and I can't believe you know that uh, you're coming up on forty years um, uh, that we're seeing a new movie. Um, and I think this one should be, um, I say this politely, a lot better than some of the other versions. <laughs> it, I mean, <laughs> looks it's, like it, it's looks pretty fun. It's evergreen really stuff, fun. you know, like, like there was my turtles and my, my main, you know, my, my closest siblings. I have a sister who's 18 years younger. She has her turtles. I have mm -hmm. a niece who has the Nickelodeon turtles, like every couple of years, man, that you get a full new audience for this stuff. It's, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, Peter, do you have uh, any places you want to send the, uh, the cartoonist kayfabe audience, any uh, social media that you want to promote or anything? 
Uh, I don't have anything at the moment. I am not doing any shows or signings as far as I know so far. Well, how about you join us for a conversation with Ninja Turtles number seven? Uh, well, yeah, that, that that is true. We are going to do that. I think we're.